All right, welcome back. Wasn't that a great session with Giselle Ruiz on just how to be uh, uh, how to bring authenticity? So that was a great session. So now uh, I'm so excited to introduce this session. It is an executive session with the Honorable Maria Contreras Sweet. Uh, the former administrator for the U.S. Small Business Administration and an amazing global entrepreneur and business leader. And so to kick off uh, this session, I'm really excited for our moderator for the session. She is uh, an Emmy Award winning news anchor for Univision Washington. Uh, please welcome to our moderator for uh, for this session with the Honorable Maria Contreras Sweet, my good friend, Sisiki Felix. How are you, Sid? It is an honor to be here today. Um, it's an honor not just for us, their organization and the mission, but also the fact that we are celebrating our history, women. And what better way, Sid, than to be able to honor it and to celebrate it with Latina leaders. And the one that you're mentioning right now is a trailblazer, a pioneer, an icon for a lot of us and a source of information and, of course, inspiration. Thank you. We're gonna start today, amigos, with uh, someone that has a lot to offer for not just women in general, but everyone, Maria Contreras Sweet. She's someone that I met a few years ago in Chicago. I will say um, she was one of the best speakers at different organizations and national organizations where she would provide that source, not just of inspiration to a lot of women, but also to the, inform us how to get about life, how to make sure that we achieve our goals. Maria Contreras se encuentra con nosotros. Maria, she's Mexican from Guadalajara, Mexico. She came to the U.S. at the age of five. And Maria, thank you so much for being with us in this great event from ACER. You know, we are so proud of you. It's interesting. It must be the Mutual Admiration Society because for me, uh, television doesn't uh, just reflect America. You know, it tells us everything that's going on in America, right? And the fact that we have your voice across the country telling our stories is fundamental to all of us. So thank you for all that you're doing. Thank you, Maria. Um, we have a lot to learn from you. Um, I believe that a lot of women do not find a way to achieve their goals, how to find a balance, how someone that comes from Mexico, whose mother was working at a, at a meat factory. I mean, that's just amazing. There's so much I want to get from you. And I'm sure we have a lot of people watching us trying to form uh, their questions. And I'm sure we're going to have a, a few minutes for all of you to um, ask questions for Maria Contreras today. Not only she's been in the private sector, but also in the public sector. So give us a little bit of your perspective, Maria, since we're in the month of March. Mujeres Latinas en este país, diversity, production. What's your perspective? Where are we right now as women? The exciting thing for me is just to be with all of you here today, because if you are on this uh, broadcast, then I know that you are already leaders. You're already in corporate America doing great things and changing the world. Corporate America today plays such a pivotal role. And I have to tell you, having come out of corporate America, I was trained by Westinghouse Electric and then uh, eventually moved on to 7UP RC Bottling Company. And now I've served over the course of my career on the boards of different corporations. And so I can tell you that I couldn't be prouder today that corporate America is actually talking about ESG, the environmental, the social, and the governance issues facing our country. And you, as Latinas, as women in corporate America, represent that new commitment and that new era where corporate America can not just benefit from society, but also contribute to society and make sure that we're having impact in communities, in our supply chain, and in our employment. So saludos a todas ustedes, all of you women who are making an impact and change in the corporate community. Maria, you are already there. And I agree with you. It's It's been, a, a, a of course, a, a journey uh, for you to get there and to show the rest of us that it is possible. But once you're there, once you are at the at the mountain, what would you think are the major challenges that we women face? And how have you, Maria Contreras, have been able to overcome them and show that it is possible? What are those major challenges that you can share with us? 
Well, Tosiki, I love that you mentioned that, you know, I was born in Guadalajara, Jalisco, Mexico. I came at the age of five. I couldn't speak a word of English. And uh, when people talked about Thanksgiving and I saw a turkey, I'd never seen, I just thought it was a really big chicken. And I figured everything became bigger in America. Um, and so it was, you know, just navigating through life, learning the language, learning the culture. And so some of that for me was some of those challenges that not only was I trying to just learn literally English uh, and the culture, then there's also the corporate navigation. And then there's the glass ceiling that we all uh, are faced with. And so it was really important for me to understand what those games were. And someone once gave me this little book called The Games Mother Never Taught You. And it's about how we have to learn to work in teams. And so for me, that's why for my daughter, I always had her play in sports. I had her learn about teamwork. I had to learn about passing the ball to somebody else. And I think those are still important lessons today that we can learn from each other. How can we make sure that we're advancing, but make sure that we're passing the ball to others, working with others and developing teams around us of support? Now, there's some, something very interesting that uh, you became a chairwoman when you opened your own bank, Maria. What can you tell us about the experience from the perspective of a Latina who's leading a financial institution in an industry that's not dominated by men? And I'm not the one of, I'm not one of those women that believe, oh my God, we're competing against men and we're better than men. Absolutely not. I believe that women are complement. We have our strengths. Men have their strengths. However, having said that, I do believe that there are certain challenges, as you said, how to work as a team. How, how are we able to um, work together towards the same goal? And sometimes that's not an easy task. How do you do it? You know, I think you raise a really important question that I've often contemplated, and that is that, um, you know, I was, I was a poli-sci major in college. I didn't understand finance, but I understood very quickly how crucial it was. You know, you can be a physician, but if you understand physician and you understand finance, you can run the hospital, right? You can know how to be a great sous chef, but if you understand financing, you can access capital, you can own the restaurant. And so it was important for me as I navigated through Westinghouse to understand what the different um, business issues were, but also to understand how they were all financed. And so I read the proxy statements, I read the annual reports, I listened to the earnings guidance in our company at 7up and, and learned to understand how things were financed, how we leverage capital, mezzanine capital, all of those things. And eventually, as you as you know, um, Westinghouse asked me to be a part of a, an, an executive team where we conducted a leverage buyout of uh, 7up. And that's where I really learned you know, how to manage capital. The governor asked me then uh, to serve as California's Secretary of Transportation, Business and Housing. So I was three secretaries at once. And there too, I learned about how do you use capital in a government construct? And uh, eventually when I left office, I thought I've learned so much. I learned corporate America and I've learned how to run a big government, the fifth largest economy in the world. What do I do with that? And what I saw was the common denominator across our country is that Latinas, for the most part, we were not getting the credit that we deserved. We didn't have access to capital so that we could start our business and scale it. And so I thought that that was probably the, one of the most important things I could do is leave office and start a Latina owned bank. And so we put a bunch of, again, teams together to raise the capital, to build the business plan, to navigate through the governmental labyrinth. And we were given the first charter to begin a financial institution in 40 years, in two generations. I was really proud that Latinas came together and put their money where their mouth is and said, you know what, it is time that we own our own bank. Not that just that we get banked, which is important, but that we own our own financial institutions. And so women came together to do that work. And I felt it was really important then for us to make sure that we were servicing Latinas with the, the credit they deserve, the respect that they deserve. And so that is to me, uh, to Siki, the, the message, if you will, that um, I never thought that I could start a bank. I didn't know how to run a bank, had never you know, been close to a bank. But I learned a lesson in corporate America as I saw people getting rotational opportunities, that if you have a basic skill set, there is transferability in that skill set. When I was in government, a lot of the skills that I was using about marketing, 
you know, I was promoting the census count. I was promoting, you know, how to use uh, Caltrans, how to use the railroad system. And so there's so many skills that we possess that are transferable into new opportunities. So I think that we learn that in corporate America where we give an executive an opportunity to work in HR and then in finance, and then maybe we give them an expatriate assignment. As Latinas, we have to take on those assignments. So we move up into general management. And for me, that's the way I navigated it. Um, I find very interesting, Maria, the fact that you mentioned you've been navigating in the public sector and the private sector. And the fact that you said, I did not know anything about finances, you learned it. How did you go about going from university not knowing anything about finances? Did you go to school again? Did you take courses? And also tell us, how was your experience being the cabinet level appointee of the president of the United States? That's an amazing position. Well, thank you so much. Again, for me, um, I've learned that, you know, when we go to school, we're not learning rote material. What we're learning is how to learn. Mm -hmm. And so what I found for my advantage was when I became an officer at Westinghouse, as an example, a corporate officer, I knew that there would be new roles and responsibilities that I would assume of topics I had no prior knowledge of. And so I would always get the best people around the table and have them debate the issues. And so I did that in public office and it served me really well. I was asked to get, write a, a white paper on how to manage healthcare in California. And I was a secretary of transportation, but I had served on a corporate board of a, well, Blue Cross of California. And so I knew a little bit about healthcare and I decided I, you know, it was important for me to write a paper for the governor and provide him my perspective. So I brought in, I asked physicians, I asked providers, I asked patients, I asked labor leaders to come in and to talk to me what they thought were the best ideas. And then I listened to them debate and talk and discuss. And from that, you're able to glean, you know, essentially what the key points are, what the conflict points are, how to resolve those, how do you build consensus? And so when I wrote my white paper, then the governor said, you know, you have such a good handle on how we manage healthcare that I'd like to put you in charge of that creation of that new department. And I'm so proud because it's such a rare opportunity to be able to actually create a brand new regulatory construct within government that is enduring and becomes a legacy. And when I hear that it's still one of the better run uh, departments in state government, it gives me great pride and great joy. It gives me great pride and great joy also to be hearing from you directly, Maria, the fact that you need to surround yourself with people that can help us thrive. And I'm glad that you're also pointing that out. What has been a defining moment that you can share with us, with women? Uh, we're hopefully getting out of this pandemic, but it hasn't been easy for everyone. You're a mother, you're a leader, you're a Latina, and you're the daughter of immigrants as well. What do you think has been one of the defining moments that could help the rest of us, the mortals, get ahead the way you have? Oh, you're so sweet to say that. Um, I have to tell you that one day, uh, my daughter, Francesca Maria, came home from school and it was uh, Martin Luther King uh, Day and they were studying leading African-Americans. And I was so struck by how engaged she was, how much she honored the stories that she learned and then I reflected because remember, my daughter's now, uh, what is she, 38? I don't want to say, I won't, I won't say her age. But, anyway, but the point is that, um, that I, th I thought to myself, what is she studying about Latinas in school? What is she learning about Latinas? And it just struck me that we didn't have as the, the bounty of stories that other communities had. And that's when I said, this has to be a pivotal moment for me. It's not and this is the grandmother story. My grandmother always said, Maria, it's not about the titles that you have, it's what you do with the titles that you have. And so I figured I have access to corporate resources as an officer. I'm able to influence our investments in the community, our donations, our philanthropy. So why don't I help start a Latina organization so that we can learn to tell our stories and get them into the school system and so I started an organization in California called HOPE, Hispanas Organized for Political Equality. And we had three goals. One was to tell our stories, to learn about Sor Juan Inés de la Cruz from Chile, Policarpa uh, Salavarieta from Peru, to hear about all these beautiful Latina icons that are in our history 
and to write a book of put all these stories together, put them out in this beautiful book. And then the women got so excited again, the women that put this work together with me, it was a great team, again, networking again. And we decided to start this organization that would be enduring. And now they help elect women to office. They help get women into appointive positions. And it's a very strong organization. I would urge anybody to, to look at it. So for me, the combination has been in my life, as you say, now I say, it's not just about my job, my career, which is fundamentally important so I can put food on the table. The second thing is I have to make sure that my family is well and balanced. The third point that I have to do is to make sure that I'm still investing in community or I wouldn't be whole. And I'm a person of faith. I'm a Catholic and I practice my faith. Uh, sometimes uh, um, I wish I were practicing it a little better, but I try. And the fifth is to make sure as Latinas that we don't forget about ourselves. We have to make sure that we're nourishing ourselves, that we're taking time to exercise, that we're being good to ourselves. You know, in an airplane, as Secretary of Transportation, I used to always announce when you're on an airplane and something goes wrong, you pull down the oxygen and you put it on yourself first so you can help others. And that is the life philosophy. We have to make sure that we're always nourishing ourselves first so we can nourish our families, be good in the company, be generous in the community, and of course, spiritual and thank God for all the good blessings that we've, enjo that we've enjoyed. And isn't that what we do many times, Maria, which is as women, as Latinas, as nurturing, uh, we're helping every person and we leave ourselves towards the end. And we cannot really pour from an empty cup. So I'm, I'm happy that you're also sharing that part as well as it's not about how many titles you have, but what to do with them. That's an amazing quote. I'm definitely going to write it down. And I'm hoping that everyone that is writing their questions for you today can also uh, resonate with a lot of the things that we're doing. Besides finding the balance, Maria, what other hurdles have you had to face throughout your career that you can share with us? And I think for most of us as women, it's always, as you aptly pointed out earlier in the conversation, is how we balance all of these things. And so what I learned is, I remember when I was having my first uh, child, it was my son, Rafael, and I went to the doctor and I said, I'm just mortified. I'm so excited to finally be a mother and uh, but I have a career and I love being involved in the community and I'm involved in my church. And so um, what do I have to give up? And he said, if you're not a happy person, your son is not going to find joy in the relationship with you. So you have to be happy first so that you can give love to everybody else. The point that we made earlier. And so what I've learned to do over the course of my life is incorporate my kids and the things that I do, and now they have replicated them. Now they're doing those same things. My son's very involved in his church and in community. And so I love that they have gone with me to political affairs. They have traveled with me with elected officials. They've been to state dinners. They've been exposed to everything that I've done so that hopefully that was another education that they wouldn't have gotten at school. And I wanna say, particularly as women, that one of the things that I learned is that we discuss at the dinner table. I call it my board meeting when I'm in the kitchen and we're all sitting down to have our supper. I call it the board meeting and I go around the table. Well, now they're, now they're all on their own, but when they were growing up and I would say, this is our board meeting, so let's go around the table and everybody talk about what's going on in their life and how do we solve these problems together as a family. And so they've learned over the years to share. Rafael shares with Francesca, Francesca mentors Antonio, and they've all learned how to critique each other without it being offensive because they do it in a um, passionate way, but not a personally offensive way. And so that's worked for us. That's been the lesson that's worked for us is that, you know, when we sit and still now when they come over for brunch on Sundays, we sit around that table again, that brunch table. And now they'll say, you know, Rafael, what was your high low? Francesca, que paso aquí? And, and it's beautiful to see that they continue to practice that and learn from each other and grow from each other. And it keeps them together, which is what I love. So I say for all of us, when you're reluctant to share your financial problems with your children, because you think they might not take it well, I would say embrace it. You know, and I, you know, like children, here's what I, you know, the, the bills that we have this month, and this is how much income we have. How do we prioritize? How do we manage this? And kids learn this and um, and become so strong by it. You know, they are really empowered by the knowledge 
and the challenges that you share with them and how you solve them together. So I would say be as open as you feel comfortable being with your family. I really like that, um, Maria. Also, I was talking to a friend of mine who's a psychologist and she shared with me very briefly, telling me that she had never hidden her marriage problems for, from her kids, but she had not done them in a way that were um, detrimental to their to their um, infancy or their, their child years, but she will make it a point to make sure that they would understand once they came to an agreement, the kids will understand the issues are there and, and the parents were able to resolve them. Now, this is a decision that was made. And I'm glad that you're also sharing the same thing with uh, financial problems or anything that has to do with their own raising issues. Now, what do you think as Maria Contreras suite with all the obstacles and the challenges has there anything been that you had to give up, Maria, throughout the years? Oh, certainly. I mean, I could tell you really sad moments for me. Um, you know, I remember when the governor asked me to serve on his cabinet as Secretary of Transportation, and Antonio was only turning seven years old. And so he didn't want to be displaced from his school. My husband didn't want to, you know, move away from, you know, the work that he was doing and the other kids. And so, I decided that I would commute Katsiki. So I got up on Monday mornings from Los Angeles where I lived and still live and flew up on a 6.30 flight up to Sacramento to report so I would be there you know, by 8.30 in the office. And I'd stay there until Friday afternoon and come back Friday night. And it was so tough for me to call Antonio to do our prayers at night over the phone you know, to miss out on so much. So there's sacrifices. And I remember just being so upset by this. Um, and then so one weekend uh, I was home and uh, the governor called to ask me about a, a bill that he was thinking about signing and I had recommended a veto. And my daughter, Francesca, just said, mom, he doesn't let you have a break. You know, you need to be with us for a little while. And the little guy, Antonio, just, just he looked back at Francesca and he pushed back and he said, you know, Francesca, she's doing really important work and her work is having a lot of effect on a lot of people and we need to support her. And it just made me cry that I was you know, weeping all the time that I was missing Antonio and here he was getting it. He got it and he was supportive. And so it's those, it's those things, you know, that how we imbue them with values without even knowing that we're imbuing them. And so I think that, um, we all make sacrifices every day that way. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a tough situation not to be at certain things. Um, and certainly we've made sacrifices, but I love that the kids have appreciated it, valued it, and knew that I was not with them just because I was, you know, off at a swimming pool having a martini or something, but that they knew that I was doing some work to impact others and many people who had less than we did. And uh, that those are lessons that they still respect today. I was uh, talking to the ambassador of, of Mexico in the U.S., uh, Marta Barcena, and we were having a very candid conversation as well, Maria. And she told me that the formula for her marriage to work was balancing. Sometimes she will be the ambassador. Sometimes her husband will be the ambassador and she will take the back role. But I asked her, what is the main trait that you find yourself as a woman to make sure that your marriage is lasting and you're still successful? And she said, love. What is your answer? Well, I think that's beautiful. Know, first of all, Martha's fantastic. You know, she's a career ambassador and she and I have had several conversations and I think she's just one of those, you know, stars of Mexico. She really uh, represents Mexico with a great deal of dignity and pride and, and I love her. Um, for me, I think you're right. It's situational leadership. I mean, you always have to approach everything with compassion and with love and be value laden for sure with integrity and, uh, you know, all of those things that, uh, that we hold dear. But for me, it's situational, as you aptly point out. When my husband has his family over, Maria Contreras is absolutely catering to him, telling him, honey, you sit down, let me bring the things out for you. Uh, let me do this and just enjoy your family. You deserve this time. And then he reciprocates when it's my family that's over and visiting. He'll say, you enjoy the conversation. Let me bring the dishes out. And so we, you know, we've learned to balance and not have ego in those things. And I absolutely then, of course, when the kids are, you know, are up and they need something, you know, we both, of course, are just um, as accommodating as we can be 
So, and I do that also with girlfriends, you know, sometimes they need something and you need to be there for them. And I'm grateful that when I need something that they've been helping me with the carpool or, you know, doing some advancing on something or connecting me with somebody. And so it has to be a reciprocal relationship. All relationships should be two way relationships. And uh, my husband says, it's not about giving 50, 50, it's about giving a hundred percent. You give all of yourself when people need you. And it's somehow, I don't know, I, I can't tell you Tzatziki, it always comes back somehow. Mm -hmm. You know, it was a girlfriend um, who had just, you know, I had done a small little deed for, and then later she was in a corporate situation and someone said that they were looking for Latinas to serve on their corporate board and she nominated me and it was beautiful. Another time I was in office, another girlfriend called me and asked me about how, how to navigate through uh, the USSBA to get a PPP you know, loan and we helped them do that. The next thing I know, she's in a situation where someone said to her you know, that they were looking for a Latina to serve on a corporate board and you know that got me on another corporate board. I, I believe in what Shakespeare taught us. I'm a, you know, I'm a student of Shakespeare and I believe that he said, the world is a stage, the world is a stage and life is our invitation to perform on it. And so I truly believe that we are always reflecting on ourselves, no matter where we are, at the soccer game, at the football game, at work, we're always reflecting on our family, on our children, on our community, the Latino community, and so as long as we think about that, that you know, you always wanna comport yourself in a generous way, uh, then I do think that somehow, somehow, you know, good comes back to you. It's just, it's a good karma. Absolutely, because you're giving and you're receiving as well. And you're surrounding with those loyal to you as well. I really like that. We're gonna start the questions, uh, Maria. We have a couple of questions coming up from people that are writing them, thank you. Um, I also want to invite everyone to keep doing so. Before getting to the questions, Maria, there's still a pay gap between men and women. And I'd like to touch that with you because it's still important that women doing the same job as a men are still getting paid less. Why do you think that is? And what can we do effectively to eradicate that? Well, um, you know, at the societal level, of course, we can all uh, make sure that, um, that we're making this an important issue. And, and making an awareness about it. As women in corporate America, I think it is important for us to raise our hand and to make a, a note about it. But third, as ourselves, I always say, am I tracking in careers that impact the organization? You know, there are staff organizations and then there are line opportunities. And so are you taking on the tough assignments? Are you thinking big? Uh, if you're going to be, uh, for example, if I, I pivoted from corporate, then I, I felt that I was, you know, approaching the glass ceiling. I was never going to run Westinghouse. I didn't see that in the cards for me. So I pivoted, exercised my stock options and started a business for myself uh, to avoid the glass ceiling. So many of us face the glass ceiling and we address it different ways. But again, as I mentioned earlier, I think that the more you know about financing of things and how to leverage capital, it really helps you. And so I urge all of us to understand what it is that the CEO of the company is struggling with. What is their vantage point? So that when you're making day-to-day -day judgment decisions, you're making them in a way that helps that CEO advance and people will see that, right? And to make sure that you're talking about what you're doing so that people are aware about, about your goals and objectives. And so that's what I, I recommend to people is to think bigger and as you're working to do those big things, to have impact in the organization, that you are providing what I call championing of others, championings, uh, championing champions, <laughs> uh, because the more that we champion others, it takes us up along the way, right? All boats rise. That's a great suggestion, Maria. Thank you. Thank you. Learning. How does a company work? Learning about finances and being on top of what's happening when it comes to our jobs. We have the first question, Maria, and it says, I'm trying to build my corporate network. Can you give any advice of how I can grow my network to be around amazing, inspiring Latinas like you? Um, I mentioned that earlier. Um, for me, uh, inside the company, there were people that um, I saw how 
They understood different at, different aspects of the company that I didn't understand. So I would make it a point to have lunch or to have a coffee break or to take a walk when we went out for lunch for our walks um, to talk to people who understood different parts of the company so that I was still learning from them. Uh, that was really important. Um, and honestly, sometimes I did really crazy things I'm willing to share with you. Sometimes I would just see that the CEO was going to go to the restroom or walk across the hall to go talk to Don. And I just sort of make sure that I went around to, you know, bump into him and say, oh, guess what happened to me yesterday? This is what I did. But so that's what the informal things. What I wanted to share with you about the formal things that helped me was that uh, Westinghouse had a division in uh, 7up. They bought 7up. And so I saw how important the 7up division was to Westinghouse. And it gave off a lot of cash where everything else in Westinghouse was very long term. This was short term cash for the company. And so I knew how critical it was and what went out on the truck and our facings and our merchandising. And I started to learn more and more about accelerating sales and guerrilla marketing and those types of things. And so I uh, was involved in the community, as I mentioned, and I still think that that's the way to build a network. I was invo involved in the community and it just so happened that I happened to be on a board where one of our grocery store presidents was on that board. So I got to know this grocery store president. So at staff meetings, when they were talking about, gee, we can't get an extra facing or we can't get the promotion that we want at the grocery store, I'd say, you know, I can call Al, I have a relationship with them. And all of a sudden, in addition to my core function of being the government affairs person for the company, I was now helping sales and marketing. And I knew how much more core that was to the company. And so they started including me in more and more meetings. They saw that I was truly a team partner trying to bring value at every turn to every decision that the company had to make. And eventually that's how I became a, an officer and eventually a partner in the IPO. I'm sure also there is a lot of people wanting to learn how does Maria Contreras see her legacy in this world? When you are thinking of yourself, your kids, uh, the, the ones that you are an inspiration for, what do you see your legacy like? I have to tell you that, um, you know, you mentioned that my mother worked in a, a poultry processing plant and I saw her fingers thicken and her legs stiffen as she worked here in a swing shift so she could be sending this off at school and be there at night, um, you know, and, and I saw that happen. And my grandmother always said, you know, Maria, even though, you know, we've been a family of migrant workers, I have belief that someday in America, when you get to America, that you're going to be able to work in an office and that you're going to be a secretary. Well, little did she know that I would hold office and that I would be a cabinet secretary. I see that so much of my journey was as a result of entrepreneurship. It was my mother worked for a small family business because not speaking English, she wasn't going to get a government job or a corporate job. Uh, for me, my first job was in a little local florist shop and then eventually a small little jewelry store. So I believe that entrepreneurship is really the key to lifting people out of poverty. We play a very important role. And that's why when President Obama asked me to serve on his cabinet, to be the voice for entrepreneurship around the world. Um, I took that on. And so I hope that in some way that people see that I have tried to replicate opportunity over and over and over, because that is the promise of America. That is what we represent. And I think that is our journey together as Edmanas, as sisters to say, how do we make sure that we continue to integrate people into society that we give them opportunities, whether it's corporate through government or through entrepreneurship, and how do we continue to create a strong country? Um, and I, and this may be slightly off topic, but when I traveled with the president or on my own to Estonia, to Morocco, to Spain, to Italy, uh, wherever it was, uh, to Cuba, to break ground in Cuba, um, I always saw that everybody admired America and wanted more of America. They love China and its ability to invest in all of the infrastructure investments that they're making, but they love the American way of life. And so we must preserve that. And I think it's important for us to make sure that freedom, liberty, a fair democracy, fair elections continue to be something that we leave as a legacy so that we can make this country continue to be enduring and change the world 
with, uh, with all good things so that people have freedom of choice, of career, family size, all of the values that we take for granted. I would hope that if I've helped in any way advancing that agenda, I would hope that that would be something I'd be remembered for. What is next for Maria Contreras Suite in the next five years, 10 years? Well, some of you may have uh, seen what I tried to do was buy a production company. I tried to buy a movie studio. And so I got a lot of attention around the world for that because it was the first time a woman came in and beat out some of the guys in uh, putting in a bid for a major Hollywood studio. And of course, it was a Latino woman to boot. Um, so I think that telling our stories, making sure that as my daughter, Francesca, when I couldn't find a story for her, I think our um, urgency to make sure that as your daughters, your sisters, your mother, your grandchildren can see themselves in a positive contributing way, I think that's a, that's a worthy project for all of us to work on together to make sure that we improve images. I opened up Tatsiki with saying that television doesn't reflect America, it shapes America. So I think to the extent that we can have Latinas who are empowered and change makers and leaders, uh, the way you know our legacy is, as I mentioned about those stories about Gabriela Mistral and Policarpa and uh, all of those, we need to continue to tell those stories so that our daughters grow up with a sense of pride and a sense of their place in society. What would you say to the Latinas listening to you right now, Maria, that are aspiring to be in a way, Latina leaders in politics, in the private sector, what are you telling right now, day to day, to do? I think as, um, I think we've put our conversation together. Uh, I think it is about uh, making certain that you uh, look at things that you have in common with others. I'm the first to talk about, you know, empower her, Latina power. I started Hispanics Organized for Political Equality, as I mentioned, as a founder with a network of other women who helped. But I think it's important for us to honor our differences, the distinctions that we bring, the contributions of our culture, how we add so much to any environment and the importance of diversity, but balance that with look at the things that we have in common. And I'm just going to tell you one little quick story that when I was being interviewed at Westinghouse for, my, for that first job, um, I saw this diminutive man who was Jewish background. And I was this Latina coming in and I just, it's my instinct to always look at what we have in common. And so I was looking for something in common that I could express to this uh, beautiful human being. And, uh, and I said, you know, I understand that, you know, your, your wife makes really great matzo balls. I understand. I said, my mom makes the best albondigas. You know? <laughs> and we started talking about food and how much, you know, we love food. And what my point is that whenever I approach somebody, I look at the things that I have in common with them and bond with them. I'm not dwelling on the differences. And so I would encourage everybody in the room to honor your distinctive nature, but to not to dwell on it as a, as a weight, as a burden, but be lifted by the commonality that we have with each other. Great advice. You have no idea, Maria Contreras. With, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with everyone today, with myself as well. And please continue representing us. Thank you. Congratulations Thank you. all that you're doing for us too. Thank you everybody. Felicidades and Godspeed in all that you do. Gracias. Y a comer albóndigas, María Contreras. Espero que sigan ricas como siempre.